It's Edgar Peterson. I'm uh, the director of the African Center for Cities at the University of Cape Town. And um, I've been tasked with um, moderating and facilitating our conversation this evening. we particularly giddy um, because we've got some amazing guests that are spending some time with us over, over two, three days. And we thought that it was wonderful in the midst of our conversations to take some time out and to uh, show off our guests uh, to, to the Cape Town community. As you know, uh, ACC is an interdisciplinary research platform at the University of Cape Town. And from the beginning, we felt that we were challenged by two uh, central imperatives. One was to really help uh, the state, the public sector, confront the reality of um, urbanization that was unfolding in unique and unparalleled ways in the continent, and to help them think the question and to confront it. But we also knew that if we would respond to that challenge with the inherited canon from um, European theory, we would kind of miss the story. We won't really understand what is going on. And so from the beginning, there's been this desire to try and rethink, disturb, disrupt, subvert the canon. And from early on, we understood that the most powerful way to do that is to establish a conversation between the humanities and the other disciplines that is typically associated with urban studies, whether it's the spatial disciplines or sociology or political science and so forth. And the work on uh, sort of within the domain of the humanities has tended to focus on questions of cultural expression and uh, most importantly, the arts and the relationship between the arts and the city. And um, over the years, we've been privileged to collaborate um, amongst, apart from the, the researchers and practitioners within ACC who do this work. We've also had the privilege to collaborate quite closely with Dr. Kim Gurney, who um, has been doing various iterations uh, on the role of the art in the city and public space and public arts. And some of you may have come to previous publications that we've launched as an outcrop of that work. We are gathered here tonight because um, we're right in the midst of another exciting project that Kim is leading, which is called Platform Platform. And um, because we really wanted to give our guests uh, the audience, uh, Kim was reluctant to kind of speak out on that project, but she tells me the publication is imminent, and so people will be able to read more about the work uh, in the next few months, uh, in the next while. So, so watch that space. But what tonight represents is an opportunity to kind of get a look in on a set of, of intimate conversations. So we've invited five independent art spaces that is the focus of, of, of the research, and particularly the directors of these spaces in different cities to come and join us for a couple of days in Cape Town in dialogue with independent art spaces in South Africa. And so we've got a number of those from both Johannesburg and Cape Town participating in our de deliberations here in the Tutu Center. And we've spent the day together getting to know each other, exchanging and talking and so on. And so what we, our initial idea was to kind of show off all of our guests, but unfortunately, as is in the nature of work on the continent, there are always a whole range of logistical challenges that confront you. And we were not so lucky to escape those. So three of our guests um, from uh, uh, Ethiopia, from, from Cairo in Egypt, and from Accra in Ghana, were unable to join us for various logistical reasons, and this all transpired in the last few days. So our apology, the intention was not to mislead you with advertising, but I promise you, you're still in for a treat because the guests that did manage to get through uh, uh, the home affairs gates uh, <laughs> will more than compensate for those who are not here. And, uh, and we've also enrolled one of our colleagues from Cape Town uh, to join the panel, and I'll introduce them shortly. Um, so what I just wanted to mention uh, very briefly is that we didn't want them to do papers or formal talks. They're all very accomplished, and they give lectures and talks and so forth all over the world. Um, but we thought a more intimate setting, uh, and we couldn't anticipate the weather, uh, and the prospect of wine and beer uh, later on uh, will make for a much more intimate conversation. So uh, we will have a little bit of a formal piece in the beginning, in the first half an hour, where I'll ask our guests to share with us their practice, uh, and maybe a, a few reflections on the back of today, 
about how to think about their practice in relation to this conversation we're trying to curate between these different spaces. And I think what struck, struck me today, at least, um, are, are, I guess, sort of two words. Um, and, and the one is precarity, right? Um, what is distinctive about all of these uh, superheroes is that they operate in incredibly complex, challenging, difficult circumstances. But most importantly, in contexts where the state doesn't think it is required or necessary for a society to have infrastructures and resources to engage the arts. And so in that context, uh, they still just do the work and um, is able to convene and to facilitate and enable a whole set of remarkable things. And the second thing that struck me today is how that practice of just doing it, despite precarity, despite uncertainty, a lack of resources and so forth, is in some ways profoundly emblematic of the deeper questions about the nature of the African city that we continuously wrestle with. We kind of constantly trying to find a vocabulary, a set of languages, a set of concepts to make sense of this tenacity that characterizes everyday life when people make do, make the city, make a life, make a living, produce livelihood despite the odds. And so if I wasn't in the beginning, now more so than ever, I think there's an, an enormous amount of productivity to be had in facilitating this dialogue between arts practitioners and urbanists to try and make sense of our cities, but also to produce not just new languages and concepts, but I think most importantly to produce new imaginaries of what it is we inhabit, what is the wealth that we are in fact sitting on and producing, and that we maybe don't see in that way, and what that could mean for, for thinking and doing the future differently. So on that note, um, uh, uh, um, just to sort of call out who is not here, um, uh, because they are very much here in spirit, is Meskram Asagot, who, who is the director of Zoma, which is an independent space in Addis Ababa. Uh, secondly, Mariam El Nozahai from Townhouse Gallery in Cairo. And then lastly, Angela Okori, who is one of the curators at Anno Gallery in Accra. And so um, knowing and acknowledging their presence in the room, um, uh, I want to now introduce those who are able uh, to be uh, in the flesh. Um, and I need a different set of pages for that. And uh, I'm a firm believer that um, people who do remarkable work, it's important to, to acknowledge uh, what they've done. And so I'm going to do a very boring thing and not speak to their bias, but I'm going to read them. Uh, and therefore, I need to do the Benny Book for him classes. Um, and, uh, and firstly, introduce the person who will speak first as well. And it's really a great pleasure to have met you today, Rebecca, uh, who is the director of Nafasi Art Space in Dar es Salaam. And Rebecca is not just the director there, but the space is a creative hub and center for contemporary visual and performing arts in the city. Nafasi supports an artist collective, studio spaces, workshops, residencies, exhibitions, and interdisciplinary public events, providing a meeting point for intensive dialogue between artists and the public. Rebecca has curated several group and solo exhibitions in Tanzania and organizes monthly film screenings, interactive public art workshops, concerts, and festivals. She's also the co-founder and former director of the Tanzania Heritage Project, an initiative for cultural preservation that seeks to revitalize heritage music, especially through the digitization of reel-to-reel -reel archives. Rebecca was the managing director of Saudi Basura Festival in Zanzibar during 2012 to 2014. She's also the co-director and producer of a feature documentary film about Tanzanian music called Wahenga. Uh, uh, which is Kiswahili, I presume, for the ancestors, mm -hmm. which premiered at the Zanzibar International Film Festival in 2018. And when not busy with management tasks, uh, is also a photographer and installation mm -hmm. artist. Mm -hmm. Welcome, and we absolutely look forward to learn more about your practice. And then secondly, it's an enormous pleasure to now what feels like a sister and a collaborator, Joy Mboya, who is the director of the Godown Arts Center. Joy is an executive director there, and it is a multidisciplinary national and regional focal point for artistic experimentation, cross-sector partnerships, and creative collaboration. She is currently leading a unique participatory and multi-stakeholder capital project to transform the Godown Arts Center into a civic-scale anchor institution 
we need some of those internals. <laughs> um, under her leadership, the center has initiated ambitious cultural programs, including the annual Nairobi-wide Naini Wu Festival, the Nairobi County Visual Arts Exhibition, and Prize Manjano, uh, as well as numerous regional activities under the, the umbrella of the creative economy. Joy is a non-executive director of the Buni Media Film and TV Development uh, Company in Kenya and a trustee of Gara Dance Foundation Kenya. She served on the IFACA, I have no idea what that is because I'm just an urbanist, advisory board, I'm sure it's very important, mm -hmm. uh, in 2018, as well as the World Resource Institute Ross Prize Advisory Council in 2018. She has received various awards and plaudits for her work and cultural leadership and was a Salzburg Seminars Fellow in 2012 and a Ford Foundation Fellow in 2015. And uh, we've now, we will just bestow a Cape Town Fellowship on you this <laughs> evening with no money, as we tend to do. Um, and then finally, it's a really a great pleasure. I just met uh, Okona and Sali Mklandu today, who is the new director of the Great Ma Artist Studio in Cape Town. Uh, Okona has over 18 years of experience in the creative and arts sector in various parts of the value chain. She has worked in institutions like the Artscape Theatre, Performing Arts Network of South Africa, as well as independently in spaces that are considered the periphery, but also as consultant, project manager, and initiator. This includes an experimental arts residency space called the Makwanda Republic Experience in her ancestral village of Goshen, which she is founder and ideas engineer. And this is in the Eastern Cape, right? Um, she is also a practicing artist who has curated for the Cape Town Partnership, a public live art installation called Hashtag 100 African Rand, Reads, Ryan Rand, Reads. <laughs> I'm Reads. desperate as you can see on this resource theme, um, sorry for that Freudian slip, uh, Hashtag 100 African Reads and has completed a three-year fellowship in arts management with the DeVos Institute of Arts Management, University of Maryland in the U.S., and uh, Okona has very graciously uh, stepped onto the panel uh, upon our invitation um, as in some way uh, interlocutor between our discussions today and as a South African on the panel um, because originally we kind of felt it was important and necessary to have our guests uh, sort of exclusively on the panel. But we are very happy about that and thank you for agreeing to that. So without further ado, um, we'll give each of our panelists an opportunity to share some reflections. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I will, if I'm so moved by the spirit, ask you some questions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we will open it to the floor for further discussion and questions. Rebecca, please. Thank you, Edgar, for that lovely introduction. And it's just such a pleasure to be on this panel with Kona and Joy. Um, and thank you all for being here. Uh, as Edgar said, I'm the director of Nafasi Art Space in Dar es Salaam, which is the uh, major kind of commercial capital of the country on the, um, on the coast. It's a port city uh, that's characterized by um, Kiswahili, the language, uh, the kind of rows and rows of container ships on the horizon, the palm trees, um, and this uh, very kind of vibrant city um, with uh, it, it's Dar es Salaam means haven of peace. And this is something that uh, despite being one of the fastest growing cities in the world, um, kind of there's, there is a, a sense and energy of kind of a certain type of, of calm uh, running through the kind of hectic urban landscape as well. Um, so within this context of Dar es Salaam, we run uh, a space um, that hosts an international artist in residency program, um, 30 plus studios um, for artists, Tanzanian artists working in, in different disciplines. Um, so not only visual artists, but we also have technicians, um, textile designers, uh, videographers, um, dancers, choreographers, writers, um, and it's very much an artist-led and artist run space. Um, so most of the people on staff um, are either practicing, art, practicing artists when they come to the space or end up becoming and practicing art uh, during the time, their time at Nafasi. Um, and I think, uh, you know, one of the important roles of the space is to kind of uh, provide a continual reference point in the city and the country for the kind of purpose and value of many different types of art um, and really seeing art not only as 
um, you know, of course, a sense of a source of entertainment, uh, a form of education, but just a way of navigating um, the precarity that that Edgar was mentioning, um, and that we kind of uh, see within the context of an art space the opportunity to turn that precarity, that vulnerability, and instability into somewhat of a strength. Um, or a strategy or an approach to, to living and articulating kind of the, um, the different struggles that people face on a daily basis in DAR and very much looking to make um, art not something that's, uh, you know, disengaged or separate from the, the local community, but very much a part of it. Um, one of the quotes that I shared with Kim when she came to DAR for her research that I think is worth repeating is a, a Kiswahili proverb that says, Ukitam Uki vitaka kufaham utamu angoma ingia ucheze, which means if you want to understand the beauty of the ngoma, which is the kind of traditional dance, um, but I read it as kind of art practice in general, uh, then you must enter it and dance. Um, so in terms of our curatorial vision of the space, it's very much something that we focus on the, the participatory nature of it, the um, kind of immersive uh, nature of the experiences. And um, so this kind of plays into the idea that, um, you know, the, that, that moment of, of meeting and exchange between the artist, um, their work, and the public and the audience is very, very important. Um, and often um, in, in art spaces across Tanzania and the region, um, you know, we have uh, lots of um, kind of the French Cultural Institute, the German Cultural Institute, you know, and, and those spaces very much seem kind of controlled by narratives that we're looking to, uh, you know, somehow resist um, and create, uh, create kind of an alternative to. So, um, you know, really kind of questioning uh, not only the overarching societal narratives, but also the artistic narratives um, that are present. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. sure what else to to, to talk about. Um, you know, I think um, one of the things that we talked about in the workshop today, um, you know, one of our, our goal is not to, in our attempts to kind of institutionalize and create a lasting presence and a lasting um, kind of, identity within the, the Tanzanian cultural scene um, is not just to kind of, uh, you know, not, not to think of this as the idea of permanence as, you know, about a space or about certain individuals or even certain artists, but about building the, the kind of relevance of this idea of the place of art in society, um, which is something that we in Dar es Salaam, we absolutely can't take for granted um, with the various kind of pressures coming from um, you know, the state or the economic, the socio-political systems, um, it's, it's something that is always um, kind of being pushed to the margins and artist voices are being silenced in one way or another, I, whether that's kind of outright censorship or being bought or kind of, you know, commodified. Um, so, uh, so that's, you know, what we're aiming to do and, and finding a way to make, you know, art uh, something that... Um, both kind of um, injects kind of uh, certain ways of seeing and, and being in, in society and then also kind of in turn like witnesses the people who, who practice it um, and who engage with it. Um, so this experience here in Cape Town has been wonderful. It's my first time coming um, to the city and just getting the chance to hear the um, kind of ideas that, that Kim's research brought out and, and share that and discuss that with people from other, from, from here in South Africa and, and around the continent has been a really wonderful experience. And I think, you know, we had a very full day today and a lot of those ideas are still kind of, um, you know, I'm digesting them, um, but I know that this this opportunity to really reflect and um, is 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 valuable in and of itself. So thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. If I may, before we move thank on you. to Joy, just ask you one question, maybe also for our Cape Town audience. Um, I, I don't think people quite appreciate just the the heady nature, I guess, of the kind mm. of statecraft project in East Africa at the moment. Mm. Um, this, you know, determination to be the next Rwanda, to, you know, drive modernity and development at all costs. And particularly in the case, of course, of Tanzania, that this is coming with a political overlay mm. um, that's saying, look, you know, let's all unify, it's one narrative, one script, 
um, overly critical voices. Uh, this is not the time. Um, I'm kind of curious, uh, and that's very recent, right? That's the last couple of years that that's really intensified. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, so I'm curious sort of how you experience that, how you navigate, you know, that sort of moment in, 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 in the city and in the society at large. Yeah. Uh, and, and just, yeah, how, I mean, presumably you can't escape it. <laughs> yeah. No, I, one of the kind of, I, I mentioned the kind of phrase symbolic nationalism yeah. um, today in, <clears throat> in our discussions. And I mean, I think it is important to go back to Julius Nyerere, the founding um, you know, father of Tanzania, and who was very much a, a nationalist, uh, but um, kind of understood that, um, that term and, and his ideology within the wider context of Pan-Africanism, Ujama, which is African socialism, um, and you know, um, kind of wanted to address the various economic, political, cultural, linguistic ways that colonization, mm -hmm. um, you know, well, the need for the decolonization across many different levels and, and spheres. Um, and what we have now is kind of paying this kind of lip service to a lot of those ideals um, that, that Tanzania started out with, um, but in the interest of kind of consolidating state power, uh, crushing dissent, um, and really... Um, you know, kind of objecting to any sort of question. Mm -hmm. And for artists whose entire role is to, I think, to, to question, to ask questions, um, and to ask even more questions of those questions, um, you know, it's a very kind of dangerous and, and scary time, but a also vital time. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think um, just having a, you know, network of support and knowledge that there are other people, you know, kind of trying to ask, trying to engage um, is something that that's that's very, very important. And it's something that, you know, art spaces um, can can help create. Um, so just earlier this year, we had a, um, an instance where one of our artists um, was he would they were the police were trying to arrest him and came and, and he managed to get away. So they retaliated by arresting 10 other people, other artists and staff members who just happened to be around. Um, and I think, you know, they, they saw kind of our space in this industrial part of town, very, in some ways, certain ways run down. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they really didn't know what they were kind of getting into. Mm -hmm. um, so when we were able to respond, um, you know, not even by making, in Tanzania, we don't really make a big fuss about yeah. things to the media, but by calling up everyone we knew and, and really um, kind of saying, this is not right, what, you know, this can't, this should not happen. Um, you know, we were able to, to find a way out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, it wasn't actually that the art itself, um, what, you know, was used as protest, but that, um, you know, that, living as artists and being right. together as artists was allowed yeah. us to protest this injustice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, could we skip countries and move slightly <laughs> north? Uh, and just go next door. Uh, next door, yeah. Troy. Yeah. No, thank you. Again, thank you, Edgar and Kim, for inviting us here, and thank you, everyone, for being here with us this evening. Um, if I can just, um, I guess, introduce what I do by um, picking up from some of what... Um, Rebecca has shared, uh, and maybe starting with this notion of, of Tanzanian nationalism that is, that is uh, a, a moment just now. Um, in 2002, 2002, there was the entry of um, uh, certain funders into the East African region to begin to look at the question of democracy through creative expression. And one of the things that happened at that time was that the borders between Kenya Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda was not accessible right away, but became, became accessible later, opened up. And artists actually were some of the first um, people who were actually now engaging across borders. And spaces like the Godown, spaces like Nafasi, spaces like 32 Degrees East in Kampala, um, actually Meskerem space, which didn't exist then, but Meskerem was an early visitor into, into Nairobi round about this time as well. It seems that the, the, the sector really was, was at the vanguard of, of opening mm -hmm. those spaces for, for, um, for, for exchange and widening, I guess, democracy. 
Um, and it's interesting with, with Magufuli um, doing what he's doing that we do feel the effects in, in Kenya. We, we, we're very much aware that um, professionals find it difficult to now go into Dar es Salaam to work. Um, but I know that artists nevertheless still cross the borders and are still um, connecting. But our space, so I'm the um, executive director at the Godan Arts Center. I'm one of the founding directors. Uh, so I've been with this institution since its inception in, in 2003. Um, when we started out, we started out because there was actually a, a funding opportunity to start an institution. Um, prior to that, I think artistic activities, again, similar experience to, to Dar es Salaam, were supported mostly by the EU cultural centers that you, know, that you find in our cities, the, the Alliance Francaise, the Goethe Institute, the British Council. Um, there were no independent art spaces. In fact, what we had were remnants of, of, of spaces from the colonial government. So we had the Kenya National Theater, the Kenya Cultural Center, but these things were instituted um, under the colonial city. And so when this funding came along, I think a, a group of us came together to, to, to form a, a collective that would hopefully save a bit of money because we'd be working together and pooling resources, um, but also beginning to, to focus very intentionally on art and not worry about art having to speak to development um, because money was coming from a funder who was interested in, in, in development per se. Um, but I, I think we, we've come from full circle. We, we find that our art engages very much with the questions of development now. I think when we started off, we were resisting that. Um, but I think we, we since learned a few things. We, finding space, I think one of, one of the things at that time was really trying to find space for artists. What was the footprint of artists in a city? It really sort of didn't exist. Um, artists were colonizing bungalows, um, flats, mm -hmm. Some were finding, you know, container collections or collectives. Um, and we ended up in a, in a warehouse. And so the name The Go-Down actually stems from that. A go-down in East Africa is basically a warehouse. I think it was interesting that in, of course, connecting and exchanging with, with peers in, in, in the West and in Europe at that particular time, uh, there was a sense that we were doing something similar to what was happening in Europe, which was not true. We did not, um, we did not choose a warehouse because we thought it was a cool thing for artists <laughs> to, to go into sort of, you know, unused, abandoned warehouse spaces. We couldn't find space. And in fact, there was big resistance from the artist community around occupying a warehouse for an art center. You know, everybody said, it's too far away. What are we doing in the industrial area? Um, who, who does this? This space is not going to work. Um, but, but that is the space we found. And then also it wasn't an act of gentrification because, again, the city, was, this is an emergent city, you know, there's, that, that, that's not an issue yet. That was not the question then. So, so we found that we were engaging with, 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 with peers in the West and in the North um, where there were certain similarities around the question of funding the arts, um, the question of, of artist mobility, the question of, of, um, of, of freedom of expressions, depending on what context, context you were, but there was something very specific to us. Now, of course, when we started off, we, we, we started off with those assumptions that perhaps we were similar to that. But very quickly, when we began to program the space and found that audiences were thin, you know, you could hardly have this number sitting in in a performance, we had to ask ourselves, why? What, what was the disconnect? What was not happening here? And I think there were two things, really. One was that the artist who was so hungry for recognition and support um, made a very loud noise around simply needing a platform to connect with audiences. And when we made that connection, we found that actually the work was not always ready and that it was going to be difficult for us as a presenting house, which is what we were trying to be then, um, to have consistent, good work that we could put out. And so we, we, we realized that we needed to now look at this question of supporting the training, the craftsmanship of artists as, as part, of our, part of our remit um, early on. But I think the other thing then was also the disconnect that there seemed to be between the work that artists were making and the audiences. Why were Nairobi audiences not coming to the go-down? So this sent us out into, that would 
move around the neighborhoods. It uses the language of, of the city sheng, dundam tani, which just means a buzz in the neighborhood. And so this, this would be a platform where audiences in situ in the neighborhoods would be able to see performances, and these could be music, this could be spoken word, theater, so that we could dance, so that we could begin to understand and see and observe reactions. Um, now, as we did this, there were other questions, of course, that were important to us, and one of the other questions was just the sustainability of space. We were very fortunate to, to have a funder who enabled us very early on to actually buy and own the property that we sit on. And so while we were now beginning to sort of navigate and try to understand this connection between audiences and artists in Nairobi, we were also thinking about our location and opportunity as a proprietor of the city. And so we said, well, we're a rundown warehouse. When it rains, you know, everything in the toilet just comes all the way up. The sewers are not working. Rain comes in. We actually could do with a better space. And it was a simple idea then. It was just a better space. And so we began to think about a future where we'd have a better go down. Um, as we began to explore this question of a better space and Nairobi neighborhoods, it became very clear to us that we needed to think about what it meant for us to be an arts center in the city, in the city of Nairobi very specifically, and what our relationship would be with the inhabitants of Nairobi, and what is their relationship with their own understanding of the city. So we entered this discourse around looking at the question of identity and belonging and ownership in the city of Nairobi. And of course, we, we did this through frameworks that are familiar to us as, as an art space, uh, a festival. So the festival Naini Hu, again, using urban speak, Nai is just a, a you know, it's, it's sort of a short version of the word Nairobi. Ni Kiswahili is, who English? Um, so who is Nairobi? Was basically a question that we then investigated and explored and examined through a framework of a festival. And it's a festival that is curated for the most part by residents of the city. It's a festival that in each neighborhood lasts for about a week. And it is really their, their prerogative to choose whatever it is that they wish to, to celebrate or showcase as uh, an example of who they are in the neighborhood that they are. This mobilizing people's, um, I guess, cultural awareness, um, creative sense, coincided with the city of Nairobi also beginning to look at uh, its own growth. Nairobi, like any African city, of course, is run amok. Development was unchecked, um, a proliferation of informal settlements. And so the city planners were also beginning to think about how do they, how do they begin to engage people in thinking about a new Nairobi. And they became aware, and we made them aware as well, of what we were doing with this festival. And so we began to collaborate. They saw us as mobilizers of community through the festival, um, a, an art space that had certain insights into what, was, what made people tick and how to get them to participate in processes. Um, and they were then interested, of course, in getting the voice of the people in, in inputting into the, into the planning processes. Well, to sort of bring the story to, to how it connects then to the work that Kim has been doing, um, the, the notion of exchange and connections globally are always important to us. So, we, so while we were very much aware of, of trying to unearth who we are um, and define ourselves from an endogenous base, we, we also appreciate and value exchanges and connections that can happen across cultures. And so in one of those contacts that, 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 that we made, we were brought together with, with a firm of um, Swedish architects whose practice is very collaborative, very, very holistic. Um, we find it is sensitive to the context in which um, they're, they're, they're planning to design. And so we began to think together around how to redesign, rebuild the go-down, drawing on their practice and drawing on our experiences 
of mobilizing community, of engaging community, of asking community to be a part of creating and owning the space that they live in, which is Nairobi. And so over a period of, of eight years now, we engaged in conversations that looked at the city as a, as a stage for, 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 for performance, for arts and culture, um, but also the city as a space for, for imagining a new nation. The city is a space for na nation making. Um, the city is a space that has uh, a very young population that, of course, is now very digitally connected and that is also has aspirations and imaginations around who they are and what they want to be. And so we tried to, to begin to link all of these things together as we also visioned uh, a new go down. So over a period of eight years, we worked together in looking at the notion of city planning at, at a large scale and the role of art spaces like ours in, 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 in city planning, and then zoomed in or focused in on the design of the art center itself. And again, that being a participatory process that included residents, the planners, um, artists, uh, and so on. And so we're at a stage now where that process has actually advanced. And in the coming month, we expect to actually break ground and begin to build the, the, the new go down. But some of the, I think some of the things that, that then Kim shared with us today in terms of what she found in visiting our spaces um, and seeing how we work uh, within our context, I thought were um, really resonated with, with, with what we actually are doing. Um, she shared five principles, um, which I won't repeat because it's probably not terribly interesting, but five principles that for me seem to be kind of the foundational uh, landscape, matrix, stuff, you know, that from which, from which our practice springs. So, so I'll, I'll, well, I'll, I'll share some of them. So she spoke mm -hmm. about horizontality. She spoke about things sitting at a level where everybody engages in, in a certain way, where, where um, anything is possible. Panyarus, she spoke about a, a Kenyan word, which is opportunities to, to try and find another way, to do things in a different way. She spoke about elasticity. She spoke about convergence. She spoke about uh, second chance and reuse. And again, these are things that you're seeing in artistic practice, but you're also seeing in the practice of art spaces like ourselves. So this for me is exciting because it gives me a foundation, it gives us a foundation for beginning to think about how that informs the programming work that we actually do. Is there actually a convergence there when we begin to program with what um, Kim, Kim, Kim is finding or, or trying to understand by, by looking at us. Um, the conversations these, this afternoon, I think, um, have been very rich and there have been some hard questions. I think one of the questions that was left open-ended at the end of our conversation uh, today was um, whether we can define you know, it distinctively what art is um, and whether that is different from the idea of a creative response. Is art simply a creative response or is a creative response not art? And this, this is important, I think. It's an important question. Um, it's something that I think we'll be picking up again, but it's something that we have looked at at the Art Center. Uh, I think for a long time we resisted using the word art because we didn't know what it meant anymore. <laughs> um, but I think it's something that sometimes we see, we think we know it, and then, and then we lose it again. It's, it's, it's like an image that comes and goes because the work we're doing is, is so connected with the business of living that sort of singling out this language of art or artists sometimes becomes a little bit hard, but sometimes it is actually useful in helping us describe um, very specifically one artist's practice or one artist's work or one artist's performance. So there seems to be this sort of focus <clears throat> pulling between a clarity and a blurring uh, constantly um, in, in looking at this particular question. And one looks forward to, to continuing to engage with our colleagues on this tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, Joy. <clears throat> uh, so thank you for taking so much care and drawing us into what of course has been a very long and a complex and process. And I guess the, the, 
the the sense that I'm left with or the sensibility is, you know, is that you've really honed and refined this capacity to learn and adapt all the time. And I think that, again, sort of thinking between your practice and our context here in Cape Town and in South Africa, um, often when there is an embarrassment of riches in terms mm. of institutions and resources and so forth, there's a tendency to become rather rigid and fixed. You know, this is our mission, this is our mandate, mm. this is our ambit, this, you know, that, that kind of. And so I think that there's something incredibly powerful and important in the way that you've been able to uh, give us uh, a sort of some insight into that uh, incredibly uh, thoughtful and, and evolving practice uh, that, that is really significant and profound. So thank you for that. Um, before I go to a corner, I just wanted to, I've been a little bit remiss in the beginning and I was anxious about taking too much air time um, to sort of properly explain the, the context of the project uh, that, that Kim is, is, is leading on. And so essentially what, we, what this inquiry is, is to go and visit and spend time with these five independent spaces in five different African cities whilst they are in motion, while something is happening uh, that really amplifies and exemplifies the sort of the, the, the texture of these spaces. Um, and, and so Kim has done the hard slog of doing that field work, doing the engagement and so forth. And the idea is to, is, to, uh, is to extract from that a set of principles, a set of, of logics, I guess, at some level, um, uh, in order to produce an account of how to think about the relationship and the significance of these independent spaces uh, in relation to our understanding of urbanism in African cities. Um, so, so thanks, Joy, also for sort of just clarifying that, and my apology, Kim, for not uh, contextualizing that properly. Um, so I am now going to turn to uh, Sis Okona to uh, share some reflections with us. Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, my oh. name is Okona Nzalim Lando. I'm the director of Great Moor Art Studios, um, and I'm less than a month old in the job. Um, so by way of contextualizing myself, I'll say it started with me leaving a full-time job um, at an art institution, Artscape, with all the benefits and all the cool things five years prior to moving to the Eastern Cape. So I left because institutions, its limitations, um, the frustrations that came with that, and also just feeling like I'd achieved what was possible within what that environment can allow. Um, and then leaving Cape Town five years later to go, to go back to my ancestral home. Cape Town is also home, by the way. Grappling with notions of home and... Um, and even though I had worked on some interesting projects in Cape Town, like getting to curate like this thing called City Walks for Cape Town Partnership and doing this public art installation called 100 African Reads, which really captured people's imagination. It, it seemed like, you know, during the moment, it seemed like something was happening, but I couldn't shake this feeling that I was really, really not feeling at home here and I was really unhappy. Um, and so, yeah, even with all of that, so, you know, I, I have to say, like, I'm somebody who felt unhappy and n not home in Cape Town, even though I had somebody, who, I was somebody who had a lot of access to very interesting projects that I got to work on, but this feeling of not feeling like I truly belonged here was still something that I felt. Um, so I went back home to find another incarnation of home in my ancestral village. And, um, and also with that, I wanted to also play with this, my version of urban rural migration patterns and not necessarily coming to Cape Town to be anybody's domestic worker or but just coming to Cape Town to do the cultural work or going to the world, but still living in a village somewhere. 
So I, th I think it's a very interesting thing to keep in mind when we talk about urbanism and that, you know, some of our urbanism in also includes this, this, um, this root. And um, so also while there, this experiment called Ma the Magwanda Republic experience was born and enough people believed me and people started coming to the village and interesting things happened in various incarnations, which I thought was interesting in terms of just disrupting like the politics of value creation and how I curated that existence there and the things that I still will go on to do with that space. But um, if I were to complete it, another thought, just because I'm reflecting on what people had to say. So when you talk about democracy and the arts in your context, I just look at my own life since July, where um, I was performing in Bloom. Um, people gave meaning to what my performance was, and it ended up with like um, 20 plus metropolis coming to deal with me during my performance in a, in a manner that was very militarized. Mm. So that's one, this is like we're starting from July. And then um, fast forward to just when I took up this appointment here, a week into my job, I decided, oh, let's close the office and kind of go make sense of what's going on in South Africa right now. You know, I decided to attend the memorial service of the Uinene um, Mokhojiano, who was brutally killed recently. But while I was at this um, memorial service, I went to join a protest. And in this protest, I was really not doing anything radical, but I ended up being arrested. Um, so I don't know. I don't know where we are in South Africa. I mean, I'm just one person. I don't know where we're going, um, I don't know. And the young people that were arrested with us because I was part of 11 and we ranged between the age of 19 to 47 at a time when we were just saying, we are terrified, we are mourning, we don't know what to do with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And this is how the state made sense of what we're doing. Um, so now I'm, I'm at Great Mall. Um, I've just landed, hardly. But like I'm aware that we're in Woodstock and there's things that are going on in Woodstock. People are being evicted. Uh, families that have been there for long are being pushed out somehow. Um, we are lucky we own the buildings that we're in. So what does community engagement look like in these times? Um, so I'm kind of stalking the Woodstock um, improvement district and at the same time, I'm like following the reclaiming the city conversations and I'm just like standing in the middle and going, wow. Um, and I walked into a project um, in Simonstown, which I don't know if commemorate is the right word, around the forced removals. And my own family has a story, by the way, that is linked to um, my grandfather who worked in Simonstown who, who happened to be around in Cape Town when the forced removals were happening. So on Heritage Day, we great more collaborated with Simonstown's, Simonstown Museum to unveil these benches that, you know, artists from Great Moor had been working on together with some communities from Simonstown to kind of start this dialogue around this forced removal and memorializing it and giving it the space that it deserves. But the, one of the most interesting things about this is that none of these benches could be placed where the actual removals happened because the people who own the spaces now won't allow that and somehow the city is just not playing along in that regard. So, and, and so these benches were in this garden that you had to open and there was they were not in situ and it was awkward. You walked into this thing. So, and so, yeah, I, I'm interested in exploring that further and, and this idea of when we are constructing this narrative of these urban spaces, whose narrative is foregrounded and is it ahistorical? In what ways does it kind of, you know, honor and, 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 and give due platform to 
to the before while still charting a, a, a future. Um, yeah, and the other thing that's glaring for me, when I look at the Great Moor calendar of artists who are um, due to come and visit is the, the glaring absence of like um, African artists who can plan that far and secure their space. So I'm in, yeah, so that, that the issues around mobility and the, mm -hmm. and who gets to eventually make it here is something that's also preoccupying me at the moment. So I think, yeah, Perfect. I'll stop there. Great, mm -hmm. thank you so much. So one of the, thanks. So one of the um, provocations that become possible when we have arts practitioners, artists and urbanists in a room is to, to ask um, really wonderful, unruly questions. And one of the topics we'll pick up on tomorrow, and Joy has intimated that, is whether it is possible to rethink institutions as an artwork. And this uh, comes from Kim's work. And um, it sort of it strikes me that that question is really pertinent for some of the issues you're grappling with mm -hmm. in terms of um, a set of embedded practices and habits and how does one, given the current moment in our incredibly um, um, conflicted and angry uh, time in South Africa, mm -hmm. you know, sort of what, what would that mean? Mm -hmm. 